Okay, so we're going to start very broadly, and we're going to talk about the level of popularity of NASCAR and how it got to its present context in the motorsport world, because the series is very interconnected. As we know, there's a lot of driver transfers back and forth, a lot of exhibition drives. Racing drivers are competitive, and at their heart, they want to try new things. They want to test themselves with new challenges. And that's exactly what NASCAR offers Jensen Button and, and Kimi Raikkonen. Um, regarding the level of popularity of NASCAR, there's kind of two graphs that I want to use to explain what I'm talking about. Because in the early 2000s, NASCAR in America went through one of the single largest booms of any sport ever. It absolutely exploded in attendance and popularity and TV ratings, merchandise sales, manufacturer participation. All these different elements came together to just push NASCAR to the forefront of the spectator sports world, right? Suddenly there was something that was touching the levels that the NFL could achieve, right? In terms of domestic sporting leagues, maybe the Premier League by kind of relative scale in the UK is massive, but in pure numbers, the NFL dominated everything. And suddenly in the early 2000s, NASCAR had this rise. Um, so the first graph that I've got on screen now is an analysis done by the New York Times Media Analytics Group. And what they were looking at is just the use of the word NASCAR in media, like as a proportion of it compared to other words, right? How often does it appear? Um, and then tracking that over time to basically illustrate how pervasive it was of the US media cycles. So you can see what I mean when I talk about this rapid upward curve. Um, and then unfortunately, what that set the precedent for um, is something that this next graph is going to explain. When we get through those massive periods of growth and boom, they are kind of have this ticking clock effect. And we know at some point it's going to run out. At some point, you're going to regress to the mean. But it's just where that flaw is going to be was the question. And we saw after, I guess, around 2009, 10, 11, the end of that kind of era of, of drivers where you have, you know, Dale Jr. leading the way, most popular driver of the series. Um, and of course, that initial boom starting really during the period of, of Dale Earnhardt's domination and then really following his death at the 2001 Daytona 500. It was since then that NASCAR had boomed to be this a massive, um, amazing, massive sport there. A massive, that's a great new word that I've just invented. Um, so the second graph is the Daytona 500 TV ratings throughout the years. And there are a few anomalous drops in there that can be explained by delayed races, normally caused by rain. But you do see this kind of slow, gradual decline. And at this point, you're probably wondering, well, oh, this, this video is meant to be about why NASCAR is good. And, and you're showing me graphs about its decline. And I think the reason I've done that is to just set up where NASCAR is now in a period where the decline's already happened. It's hit what many regarded as its flaw, maybe in 2017, 18, that kind of era. Um, where is it going now, right? What's the future of it? How have the, the leadership at NASCAR, the manufacturers, the drivers, change the sport to make it more in engaging, to make it like the changes that every other sport are trying to make, make the racing closer, engage the fans in driver relationships, um, the, you know, variations in, in the calendar, getting TV deals, participation, advertising. It's very different in the world of NASCAR to, to European single-seater stuff, but there are kind of converging themes. Um, I think the reason I wanted to talk about the boom in the early 2000s is to set up really there are some similar factors that underpin that that we're now seeing in the, in the boom of Formula One. And really, those are, are then going to be the things that the leadership at NASCAR are kind of looking to replicate. Um, see what, what, again, forgive me for checking my notes. Um, throughout the late 2010s, there was this negative perception. The races were not as interesting as they used to be. They had fallen into this kind of restrictor plate racing style a long time before. Um, but what the decisions taken by NASCAR technical leadership and race direction were really just falling in the way of manipulation to increase overtaking, but in kind of synthetic ways that took away from the meritocratic, again, forgive me, meritocratic elements of the championship. So the champions, it, they weren't really as valuable because they had this weird playoff structure that still doesn't make sense. And in my opinion, is unjustifiable in how much it waters down the value of winning a championship that should it should just count in, in a more logical way. In the last few years, though, what we have seen are signs of light, signs that NASCAR is coming back to, to where it should be. For one thing, we've got the next gen car. Uh, we've got the street race in Chicago that Jensen Button's racing in. Um, we've got more road races as a whole on the calendar and more 
engagement with the fans kind of on, on, on the new media side, um, and also some pretty fire merch. First and foremost, before we talk about the specific stories of, of Jensen and Kimmy, I want to talk about where NASCARs are as a technical package, because that first and foremost, beyond the sponsorship opportunity and beyond the ultimate cause of everything, cash, um, you're not going to be able to attract talent like Jensen Button and Kimi Raikkonen, and of course, the many other international drivers too. Uh, you're not going to be able to attract them unless you're going to be able to be putting them in a car that's going to be engaging to drive, that they're going to feel they can have tailored to their skills. And also, realistically, one that they feel they're going to be able to get in and compete because they don't want to jump right into the deep end of the most competitive series in the world. There's an element here where the front of NASCAR are super talented, high level drivers, but it doesn't have the kind of depth of talent that something like Formula One has, where it's going to be really hard for someone to jump in for the first time. Um, in terms of technical stats, they're simple compared to the prototypes we have in Formula One. They run uh, bigger engines than the Formula One cars, both in displacement and cylinder size. So they got 5.6 litre V8 engine. Um, horsepower, they're not touching Formula One. They only have about seven, uh, 670 horsepower. Um, but this does kind of vary between tracks. Um, what I'll run some footage of now is the NASCAR noise, because that's the iconic thing about, especially at the oval races, you get right next up to that track, the roar of 40, 50 V8 engines flying past you meters away from you, flat out in top gear, is incredible. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll cut now and, and we can run some of that and I'll be back in about 35 seconds. So uh, wrapping up in some other cool elements of the NASCAR technical package, we have sequential gearboxes like WRC cars. Uh, they used to be four speed H pattern manuals in NASCAR, but they've gone more to a sequential gearbox. It really just makes the cars faster um, and it's a bit more engaging for the driver when they're kind of getting the car to do that work for them. They can focus on nailing the racing lines, the exits from the corners. Um, there's plenty of room for setup variation in the car, so there's a lot of movement. They've got independent rear suspension. The, uh, the, the, apparently, according to the website, they have a modular steel chassis, uh, which is important for, for engineers, I suppose. Um, like any racing series, it's about finding that balance between what the car can do, where it wants to be, where the tires want to be, what the track demands, with then what the driver um, feels is their fastest way of going. What feedback they like to feel from the car, how they like the car to move around a corner. That varies massively more with cars, like, you know, with what is going to be for Kimi a front engine, you know, kind of touring car, um, as opposed to a, a rear wheel drive, rear engine, single seater Formula One car. The handling is going to be massively different, but there is still going to be that room for variation and, and kind of tailoring. Um, happens in Formula One, happens in, in every series, right? With the kind of boxy, overweight chassis, that you get with NASCAR. I mean, they're about, I think, triple the weight of, of Formula One car. Um, there's so much sliding and slippage and, you know, movement. The car's always sliding around underneath you. A Formula One car does the same, but the tires are much wider um, and they, they're they more able to kind of, they're comfortable in those high speed kind of semi slides that you get maybe like around the fast corners at Silverstone. Um, the NASCARs are, are a bit more on a knife edge and require that feel through the wheel. And that's the kind of level of skill and level of intuition um, that drivers like Kimi and, and Jensen in particular was always known as twinkle toes, Jensen button, soft on his tires, smooth at the wheel. Um, we'll, we'll see how those two styles converge, right? Because Kimi Raikkonen on his day, particularly in uh, the mid 2000s, the same time NASCAR was going through that boom, uh, the late V10 era of, of Formula One, some of Kimi Raikkonen's low fuel McLaren qualifying laps were up there with the greatest we, we've ever seen in the sport. Um, he would you know, he was a pioneer in many ways of pushing the track limits, of smashing over the curbs. Um, hopefully I'll get some stills on screen now to kind of back up some, some evidence for this, because I'm not just making this up. But he would absolutely push the car and the suspension to its limit of how much curb can you take just a fraction of an atom's width of a tire touching that white line. And every single other part of your car is on the faster part, is cutting bits of the track off to make your lap time better than everyone else. That's exactly what Kimi was amazing at. Um, and hopefully 
what I'm confident we will see is some of that uh, blend through into NASCAR. NASCAR is a contact motorsport, which is fun and it is engaging for new fans. Um, it's the only sport alongside rallycross in in motorsport that allows contact within the rules. Um, there are technically rules in NASCAR about wrecking someone intentionally. You're not meant to do it. Um, but the precedent of how that rule has been applied is so much more lenient than we would see in Formula One, where a front wing to a rear wheel and a puncture, boom, instant 10 second penalty. Or in NASCAR, it's so much easier to understeer, you know, in the, the entry of a corner into someone's rear tire, you spin them around because they said something mean about you in a press conference. I don't know. But um, that it's so much easier to do that. But that creates this sort of weird neutrality where you don't want to have more enemies than friends. So there's this interesting thing playing out where you need, particularly on ovals, you need teammates to kind of help you bump draft and to get you in the right lane, to help you out with strategy, to block other people for you. You need friends and you can't have too many enemies because you're going to put yourself at risk of, of getting knocked out of the race. And that's not good for anyone. So you can't, you have to find that balance. You know, even when the contact is allowed, too much over one side of it you you know, if you don't have the talent to back it up in the next race to avoid the contact to win, then keep wrecking other people out. It just reflects badly on you. Um, the only other that I, I know I've said the last thing I want to talk about about four times now, but genuinely the last thing I want to say before we get into Jensen Button's rise um, and what exactly he's he's kind of aiming to do in NASCAR is that alongside hitting someone on track, what is also allowed in NASCAR is to just go and have a fist fight in the pit lane. If someone's wrecked you out of a race, they haven't got a penalty for it, even though you know at heart they've wrecked you intentionally. You then can go wait in pit lane and have a, a you know a little left right jab hook combo. You can you can just go for it and you can settle it on the track. And it's something that the fans love. NASCAR again say that they don't like it, but what the precedent shows is that when it happens, all they're going to do is put an ad break either side of it, clip it up, and put it on their social media promo for the next race. Um, and that's kind of awesome, right? I mean, it's it's not a zero sum world, right? The fact that NASCAR has these things doesn't take away from other motorsports having their things, right? You can be a fan of multiple at the same time. But I just kind of like that spirit that the NASCAR represents. When NASCAR's moved increasingly to kind of a spec series where the cars are uniform between the teams and they have these kind of alpha shells to represent the uh, commercial models that the manufacturers are looking to represent. But for the most part, the team, the, the parts are completely standardized. You get this effect where the big teams can still win more often of the time because they have they're better at getting the setups, they're better at driver coaching, they can do more testing. Those factors, you know, they're better at strategies and pit stops and more reliable. All those sorts of things play out. But where NASCAR, I think, has found a good balance is that the, the spec package they've achieved allows for that Cinderella story. It allows for a team to compete with the big boys if they nail everything right. If they can, with a bit of you know bravery and luck and teamwork, a team can make it from the back to the front with the right driver combination. And, and you know, of course, a bit of luck to, to survive wrecks and stuff. Um, the one example that I want to use for that is the entrance of Justin Marks and uh, Mr. Worldwide Pitbull with their team Trackhouse Racing and what exactly we saw at the end of last year. If you're not a NASCAR fan, but you're a big motorsport fan, you uh, you probably will have seen this clip, but I think I'm going to run it. It's Ross Chastain's move to make the championship final four at Martinsville Speedway last year. Um, it was a move that was one of the greatest motorsport moments of 2022. One of the craziest things, earned praise from everyone, coverage from all sorts of different outlets across the motorsport world. Um, this is what happened. Ross Chastain used the wall all the way around this racetrack to race his way into the championship four. He went from 10th to 5th place. I mean, how cool is that, right? Anyone who's seen that and has access to jump in one of these cars to get in a series that can produce moments like that is going to give it a go. And that's exactly what Jensen Button and Kimi Raikkonen are doing. So let's talk a bit more about why they're doing it and their specific stories. Okay, so starting with Mr. Jensen Button, 2009 Formula One world champion with Braun. He's racing in three Cup Series races this year. Uh, they're all going to be road course races, and those are going to be the Circuit of the Americas race on March 25th. And then the other two are the Indy Road Course race, which he's raced out before in Formula One, and then also the Chicago Street Course race, which is a new addition to the NASCAR calendar, and it will be the first ever street course 
they've ever raced at in NASCAR. So it's going to be a completely different thing for all the drivers, including him, which should be really interesting, leveling the playing field a bit. Um, he's going to be driving the number 15 car. Hopefully we'll get some press photos on screen now. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's the Ford Mustang body. Uh, it's operated by Wick Rare, sorry, Rick Ware Racing, brutal name. Um, and it's going to be kind of underpinned by Stuart Haas, which are a much bigger NASCAR team, much more successful NASCAR team. And yes, that is the same Haas that competes in Formula One, um, but they're actually quite good in NASCAR. They're very competitive and that they build race winning cars. So fundamentally, Button will have a car to compete. Um, as I said, the first of those races and the one that Kimi is also going to be racing at is the one at Circuit of the Americas. It's a track that compete or has been the scene competition across IndyCar, MotoGP, Formula One and NASCAR really diverse set of series all taking on that track and it has different kind of upsides and downsides for each of those moto gp had a particular problem with the track surface and it had to get resurfaced before the 2022 formula one grand prix as a result of complaints that had gone in from the moto gp again but that, that's beside the point um again I'll, I'll put the track map on screen now for kota many will recognize it from its time in formula one made its debut there back in 2012 just after construction finished there's a lot of difference in corners at Kota, which is a really good thing. So you have a massive difference in high speed corners, low speed corners, long straight, short straight. Um, there's plenty of room for whatever advantage your car may have for it to be exploited if you get that balance right. Um, so alongside those three races uh, in the NASCAR Cup Series, the biggest thing for NASCAR and Jensen Button this year is his entry to the Le Mans 24 hour. So there's a special category category apologies, at Le Mans, um, called Garage 56, a spe special thing in their rule set that allows prototypes that wouldn't traditionally fit into basically the GT3 bracket um, to be allowed entry really for like promotional purposes. Basically, it's a kind of proof of concept that NASCAR can build something that will compete in the highest level of European motorsport, right? Le Mans, the biggest race in the world, the greatest race in the world. Um, I think whichever way you spin it, I mean, of course, the NASCAR promoters will claim that the, the 500 is the biggest race in the world and IndyCar 500 promoters will be claiming it's the fastest race in the world. But I don't think you can beat Le Mans as a single event, as a challenge um, with the multi-class element. It's going to be a huge responsibility for Jensen to take this NASCAR out there. If they finish the race, if they don't have any key reliability issues, it's going to be a really awesome kind of a statement in favor of NASCAR and in favor of what it can offer the sporting world. The car that they're running at Le Mans, um, once again, and many times in this video, pictures on screen now, it's got loads of these extra little flicky downforcey bits that the Cup Series cars don't have, but Jensen should still gain a fundamental understanding of the, the dynamics of the car that his car at Le Mans will be based on by racing in the Cup Series. So there's kind of two elements, the challenge in and of itself to drive the Cup Series car, but also to get time in the seat so he's best prepared then for the Le Mans entry. Um, You'll see all these extra little wings, things that add downforce and bring the Cup Series base car up to kind of GT3 level speed for the Le Mans entry. It does have the power in the engine to do that. It's got the straight line speed to be pushing, you know, 210 on, on the Molsan. Um, but it's about getting that downforce, that stability through the high speed corners that would hold back the NASCAR if you just ran a kind of raw Cup Series entry. Um, but the one that they've prepared to run at Le Mans looks like a real beast. He's going to be sharing that car with DTM champion and seasoned endurance racer Mike Rockenfeller, who's run at Le Mans before. And the third driver in that team is Jimmy Johnson. So he's had experience racing at IndyCar. Jimmy Johnson is now coming back into NASCAR for this year. And then he's also sharing the drive with Jensen and Rockenfeller at Le Mans. Jimmy struggled big time in, in IndyCar, wasn't really able to put it together, but we know he's an absolute beast behind those Cup Series cars. And he proved that throughout um, the 2010s, really, right? When NASCAR was getting to that tail end of its popularity boom. And unfortunately for Jimmy, his most successful years on track were not NASCAR's most successful years uh, in the late 2010s when he was like winning all the time, when he got his reputation as one of the best NASCAR drivers of all time. Most important thing for the Le Mans entry, um, you know, success for Jensen in the Cup Series races will be running competitively. It will be finishing. It will be nailing the strategy and just getting a good feel for the car, hopefully racing good racing with, with Kimi in, in Texas. But for the Le Mans entry, the goal is just to finish without any key embarrassments, any key missteps. Finish the race, keep the car intact, race at a competitive speed, 
and sell NASCAR up to all these sponsors and manufacturers that are, you know, adding into GT3s at Le Mans, getting in this new hypercar class. We've seen Ferrari with an incredible looking car ready to compete there. Um, so many eyes on Le Mans win on Sunday, sell on Monday, right? That's what the goal is, um, to sell the series of NASCAR. And the good thing is the way that they're going to try and sell that series is to try and push this car with some elite drivers around the track as fast as possible. So that's a good thing for us is we'll get to watch. Let's hope it's good enough to allow Jensen to, to do exactly that and to sell NASCAR. Um, and yeah, let's hope the Cup Series running gives them some quality time. Now let's move on to the Iceman, Mr. Kimi Raikkonen, 2007 Formula One world champion, one of the greatest qualifiers ever in the history of Formula One, one of the best overtakers in the history of Formula One. Um, one thing that's very clear about the Finn is on his day, those low fuel McLaren laps from the end of that V10 era never was able to put championship contention together to compete with, with um, Michael Schumacher back there or Fernando Alonso. Some of his pole laps were unbelievable. I said earlier about how important him pushing track limits was and to have this confidence to just send the car, you know, let it get light underneath you, right? Push everything you can to the absolute maximum. Um, I mean, on his prime, he was an inspiration to many drivers throughout the grid. He was an inspiration even to Lewis. Lewis said when he was joining, Kimi was was the idol. Um, 21 Grand Prix victories for Mr. Raikkonen, more, I believe, than Jensen. Um, and yeah, pushing right until the edge of, of the atoms. Um, Kimi's own Formula One hero was actually, and this is going to require a bit of camera work, because um, we can pan over here to... Not Jackie Stewart, but Mr. James Hunt. So James Hunt for Kimi was an icon, not only in the sense of his off-track personality, but his on-track characteristics too. That confidence, that bravery, that level of risk that Hunt was willing to commit was what Kimi was looking to emulate and did in his title winning year before that and after that. Um, you can argue that his speed dwindled off a little bit. He was second fiddle to Seb in, in the Ferrari years when they were competing with Mercedes for the titles in 17 and 18, but no one doubted the raw pace of Mr. Kimi Raikkonen. A brilliant little gem from Kimi Raikkonen's Wikipedia page. I can't claim that I discovered this through any proper research. It was just on his Wikipedia page. But Kimi would use James Hunt as a pseudonym to compete in races in Switzerland. So he would compete. It was There was one that was a powerboat race, one that was a snowmobile race. Kimi would go and sign up and say, uh, he'd try and hide, didn't want to say that it was Kimi Raikkonen. So he would say, oh, I'm James Hunt. Um, not a very popular name in Finland. I don't know how it actually allowed him to hide because surely Kimi Raikkonen, at least it's a Finnish name. But it worked for him. Um, Hunt was also an inspiration for some of Kimi's helmets. So we'll see. I'll be showing pictures on screen now of, of some of those. Um, in terms of NASCAR, Kimi's first attempt came back in May 2011. I'm going to have to go back to the notes here, make sure I get my facts right. So May 2011, um, Kimi left Formula One at the end of 2009 for his first break away from it. Um, he spent 2010 in the WRC with Citroen, smashing a little Citroen hatchback around Forests, and he did end up with wins in the WRC, which were really, really impressive. Um, so 2011, after he's finished his rallying exploits, Kimi signs with Kyle Busch Motorsport um, to race in the Truck Series and then the Nationwide Series, which in the hierarchy of NASCAR are the bottom two. So the Cup Series that... Jensen and Kimi are racing in now is the kind of top of that pyramid. Then you have what is now called Xfinity and used to be called Nationwide, the middle tier of that pyramid. Um, and then the bottom tier is the truck series. Hopefully we'll get some graphics to illustrate that point beyond my uh, hand gestures. The only interesting thing is that a driver can compete in more than one on the same race weekend. So a lot of the cup series drivers will compete in the lower down classes as an equivalent of testing time, of practice time, to kind of hone their skills in, to learn the tracks, to get experience. They'll compete in more than one. A lot of people disagree with that, so it's unfair. You're not allowing that ladder to serve its own purpose if you're allowing people to go back. It would be silly to watch Verstappen take a two-minute race win in Formula 2. It just wouldn't make any sense, right? But we do see that in NASCAR sometimes. Part of it's just the fact that it's not as big as the European motorsport and they want the prize money, they want the sponsorship attention from being, being able to run as many races as possible. In So his debut race in the truck series was at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, he qualified p31 out of 37 not very good but he, what he did do was make his way up to p15 in the race um charlotte motor speedway a beautiful track a home track for, for my side of the family that live in charlotte 
Um, and what I will do now is overlay some amazing Jack Thrallful original photographs of, of the Charlotte Motor Speedway where Kimmy was testing. Uh, went on a track tour there last summer. It was very cool. Um, wonderful tour guide, Rick. Shout out to Rick. Um, very knowledgeable and pushed the limits of what the tour truck could do um, by flying it up around the top banking. Um, and letting us, he parked it at the top and let us go out and walk, walk down the banking. It was very cool. Um, but yeah, so that was where Kimmy made his NASCAR debut. Then he also tried to run in the Nationwide Series, the, the series above that, to gain some more experience. The problem with that, though, was that he got damaged in that race um, and was unable to, to kind of compete competitively. Then after that, um, we're still back in 2011 for Kimmy. The principle, the goal was to then get him testing, to get him kind of moving up. So my autofocus has got me got me in frame here. So we had a test at the Sonoma Roadway race course, um, but it wasn't something that went particularly well. We shunted the car in the test. Yeah, that is, sorry, uh, forgive me. I'm worried about my autofocus here. So we ran the car at the Sonoma test. It didn't go well, big shunt in the car. Tensions rise a little bit about what his ability is going to be. And unfortunately, those tensions rise at the same time where negotiations with Renault around the Singapore Grand Prix in September 2011 they get back going again and a return to Formula One for Kimi Raikkonen was more attractive, both economically and I think competitively, than continuing to try and rise up the ranks of NASCAR. So the more successful those negotiations became, the further Kimi got from NASCAR. Now, what we're going to have to do here is imagine a very clever transition of all the important events from this 11-year window, or 12-year window, forgive me. No, 11-year window, sorry. From May 2011, May 2022. Oh, look, you know, what have we got? British coalition government, BP oil spill, pfft, Leicester win the Premier League, Barack Obama, Trump, Xi Jinping, pfft, loads of stuff going on in that 10-year period. But more importantly, we flash forward to May 2022, and it's announced by Trackhouse Racing that the Iceman, Kimi Raikkonen, it's time to make his return to NASCAR. It's time to come back, and not to come back in the truck series or the xfinity series he's coming back in the cup series and he's coming back with track house racing the same team that gave ross chastain the car to make that move to get into the playoff final four at martinsville in the clip i rolled earlier they're the ones bringing kimmy's car together um the number 91 to put it in contention so last year he get we get this announcement that kimmy's going to run at the watkins Glen race um he only had a 20 minute test to get prepared for it and the watkins Glen round is, is one of the more iconic road races in nascar so we've got these new next-gen cars. So this is all last year, remember. Kimi signs up, does this, goes to Watkins Glen, qualifies 27th out of... 27th out of 39, but he ran as high as the top 10 in the race and stayed competitive through the yellow flags. Um, hopefully I'll be able to run some footage now of him battling with Chase Elliott, one of NASCAR's most popular, most skilled drivers, was racing fairly well wheel-to-wheel wheel -wheel with Kimi. Kimi was throwing the block, um... And it was fair, right? He had earned his spot to be there. Kimi was competitive, and so was the grid around him. It was really exciting. Closing up on the back bumper, looking to the inside. Now the outside going into the bus stop. Kimi throws the block. Now they're going into the bus stop side by side. Chase backs out. Still right there on the back bumper, looking the inside now in the carousel. Unfortunately, in the Watkins Glen round, Kimi got caught up in a crash, got taken out of the race. Um, so this kind of opportunity to come back at Cota with also Jensen Button coming in, drawing headlines that way, this is going to be a race that a lot of people watch, maybe people that only watch this race out of the NASCAR season. It's Kimmy's opportunity to get back in the headlines. Um, not suggesting that he would enjoy getting back in the headlines, but he would enjoy being there on merit on account of the fact that he ran well in the race. So I think, yeah, that, you know, Cota is, is that opportunity. It's going to be a really cool thing to see people watch NASCAR for the first time, to see people give it a chance. And hopefully people can be empathetic with why Formula One drivers are choosing to do it. Um, before I wrap up the video, I do want to give a special mention to the Aussie V8 Supercar Series. So probably the series that's most similar to the NASCAR Road Rounds. Their champion, reigning defending back-to-back -back champion, Shane Van Gisbergen, uh, in an interview with fellow V8 Supercar veteran and, and current Penske IndyCar driver, Scott McLaughlin, um, Van Gisbergen said that he was interested in giving NASCAR a go, like Kimi and like Jensen making that transfer to the cup series in a road race round in the most conservative of predictions van gisbergen if he really does give it a go and they really give him a competitive car maybe 
McLaughlin can get him in a Penske, it's going to be trouble for the front of the grid and potentially more trouble than it will be for Jensen or, or Kimi coming in if, uh, sorry, if Van Gisbergen committed to do that full time. I mean, he's more in his prime of his career than, than Kimi and Jensen are, and he would really shake up the results. So hopefully we'll get to see that. Um, for now, though, with Kimi and Jensen both running in Kota, it looks like a really awesome opportunity for the series. Um, and there'll be a lot of people watching NASCAR for the first time on that day. If you've made it to the end of this video, you know more than those people. And you're going in a little bit more informed about the background behind it, why they're making the transition, and what exactly the history is between Jensen and, and Kimi's involvement. Thank you very much for, for watching. If you have made it to the end, hopefully this was an enjoyable video and we can look forward to the race. So let the outro roll. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for watching. This has been the Jack Thrillful Show talking about NASCAR.